I have two readings today. First is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, beginning at verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised, and, he, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The second reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Well, thanks, Helen, and uh, very good to be here with you today. I'm Brian Harris, service pastor at large here at Kerry. And uh, it's my privilege to look at the fifth part of the Soul Care series, where we're going to look at healing life's wounds, healing life's wounds. Let, let me start just asking you a question. So why did Jesus die on the cross? Like, I mean, we, we know that he came to this planet knowing that he had died. Why did he do that? And what was he trying to, what was he hoping to achieve through dying on the cross? And... I'm not going to make this like as a Q&A because there are a few too many people here today, but I imagine that your answer would be he died so that our sins could be forgiven. And that's a very good answer, and that probably is the singly, you, you know, most prominent answer that comes through in Scripture the whole time. You can think through a number of verses. Uh, you've got Romans 5.8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it, it's a link. Our sinfulness, Christ dies for us. Or 1 John 2.2, 2. he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Or let's look at 1 Peter 3.8, for Christ also suffered for our sins. The righteous for the unrighteous in order to bring us to God. Or you could take an Old Testament take, Isaiah 53, uh, verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. In other words, he died because of the things that we had done. He died because of our sinfulness. So, uh, answer, quite simple. Why did Jesus die on the cross? He died because we sinful people. He died that our sins could be forgiven. And you quite likely think, yep, actually, you know what? I do know that. <laughs> and it's quite nice to have the reminder. And that's very refreshing. And I don't want to take forgiveness for granted. I have actually asked for God's forgiveness. I've received it. So kind of, if that's what you're talking about today, been there, done that, should we go to morning tea? Uh, and I hope that that's not necessarily your view because we shouldn't take forgiveness for, for granted too much. But I'm wanting today to explore in a slightly different direction. Because the cross while very much about forgiveness for sin, is actually also very much bigger than that, very much bigger than that. And so if you go through the history of the church, there was a little summary phrase that was often used, that Christ died uh, for the, for the, so that we would have the defeat of sin, death, and the devil. The defeat of sin we spoke about, the defeat of death, the defeat of the devil. All those things are accomplished at the cross. 
And then if we go to this passage in Isaiah, which was so beautifully read to us by Helen just a moment ago, uh, listen carefully to what Isaiah says. And let's remember, Isaiah's writing 700 years before the cross actually takes place. So this 700 years before the cross event, uh, this is what he's saying. Surely, or assuredly, we can be very certain of this, says Isaiah. He took up our pain and bore our suffering. He took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Now, now notice there are actually two big ideas that Isaiah has there. Idea number one is he takes up our pain. He takes up our suffering. And the second idea is that he's actually taking up our sinfulness as well. It's not an either or, it's actually a both and. And I think Isaiah is actually recognizing something that's really very, very profound. Like in life, we are both sinners and we are sinned against. We are both sinners and we are sinned against. So, so when we talk about actually Christ dying for our sins, like that's one thing, but many of us carry pain in life because we have been sinned against. And it's really that dimension that we're wanting to look at today, because in the Soul Care series, we're asking the question, what does it take to have a healthy soul, to like deep inside of yourself to be well and to be healed? And, and I think that as, as Rob Rammer has written his book on soul care, he's recognizing that many people have wounds for which they need to be healed. Many people have had deep suffering, something that has happened. And no, they were not the people who were responsible for it necessarily. They were not, it wasn't anything sinful that they necessarily did, but something happened to them, and they're going through their life, and it holds them back. And you may say, like, well, I don't know, has that ever happened to me? Well, sometimes you see it, or you sense it in people where, and I don't even mean the situation where you think, that was a little bit puzzling, not, not, not really quite sure why that happened. You, you might, for example, maybe you're raising your kids, and one of them might just knock over some milk, and you find yourself just screaming at them, like, how hey, you be so clumsy, you know, silly, and, and it's like completely disproportionate to what's happened. And you think, well, where did that come from? And maybe it's coming from too much stress, but... Sometimes something is just a trigger of something else that's inside of us. Or maybe someone nips in front of you in the traffic, and like you've been there and you've been waiting your turn very patiently to be able to turn right or whatever, and someone just nips in and like, like it's not right, they shouldn't have done that. But, but you find yourself just yelling out and like, like tooting away at them and like, and you think, that's just a little over the top, isn't it? Like, I mean, was something not very big that happened, but here I am, I'm reacting so strongly, or maybe we've seen someone else who's just reacting very strongly, and you think, well, seriously, what was that about? That was just disproportionate. And usually that's an indicator that either we've just had too much stress, because stress is cumulative, and like when stress builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up, and then just the tiniest thing, and we, 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 we topple all over. But sometimes it's not stress, sometimes it's actually there's something from the past that we carried, something that's just never really been dealt with. And so today I want us to ask this question, to, to what extent is Jesus' death on the cross for our healing from wounds and pains from the past? To what extent does the cross of Jesus not just forgive us for our sins, but somehow set us free from the pain that we so often carry in life? And what now seems almost like a lifetime ago, I was a chaplain to university students. And I remember just sitting down with a young man one day, and he, he was a very committed Christian guy, um, but he just looked like really down. Uh, he was obviously very unhappy. He seemed to be fairly unsure of himself. And we were just talking when suddenly, like we were just talking about nothing at all really, and then just suddenly out the blue, he said to me, Brian, you have no idea you have no idea how difficult it is to, to grow up in a home where you've got a brother who just cannot ever do anything wrong and you're always the one who's like to blame and you're so obviously not the favorite, fa fa favorite child. And I just let him talk. And he said, you know, in my home, my older brother, like my dad just loves him. 
he's studying medicine at the moment, and like that, that my dad just thinks that, that that's the most amazing thing, that my brother would be studying medicine. I'm just studying engineering, um, which was an interesting comparison. Sorry about it. If, you, if you're engineers here, like in his world, engineering, way inferior to medicine, and for the rest of us, you wouldn't dream of either, well, what, whatever. So, you know, I'm just studying engineering. And like whatever my brother did, that was like perfect. And whatever I did, it was like never, ever good enough. But there was one thing that I could always do that I was much better than my brother at, and that was running. Like, I've always been a really fast runner. In fact, when I was seven, my brother's two years older than me, he, he was nine, I started beating my brother at, at racing. Like, I was just seriously fast. And then I got to high school, and I entered into the state uh, running championships, and I got into the state team. In fact, I didn't just get into the state team, I was like the first in, like I was the overall winner in the 100 meter sprint. And I was actually just the tiniest fraction of, of beating the state record for 100 meters. And so I, I went home and uh, like I was so excited and I, I told my parents, you know what? I was in this running championship today and I've been selected for the state, I'm gonna run for them. And my dad said to me, yeah, very good. But you do need to remember that running's not going to put food on the table. You should take a leaf from your brother's book. He's going to study medicine, you know. Uh, now that's something really worth, worth going for. And like when he said that, I just knew that nothing that I ever did was going to be enough. And so the next day, I phoned the coach and I said, I decided to give up running. I'm not going to carry on. And I dropped out the team. And I never did take part in that. And so here I am, and I'm studying engineering, which isn't medicine. And my father just keeps on reminding me what a disappointment I am. And I find that a very, very, very heavy weight. And paused. And like he'd just been speaking. I mean, I, I summarized that probably in about two or three minutes, but it took him about half an hour to say that. And we paused for a while, and I kind of sat in there, okay, so, so have you ever heard this idea that we live quorum Deo? Like it's a, it's a Christian idea that we are always in the sight and the knowledge and the presence of God. And I wonder how it would be if you, like obviously that was a horrible, horrible experience you had when your dad just basically just trashed that you've been selected for the state team. Uh, how would it be, like, like if, if we always live in the sight and the knowledge and the presence of God? I mean, that means that God was there when that was happening. I, I wonder how it would be if you could, could hear what God was saying to you at that particular time. And he kind of looked at me as though it was a little odd, and he said, like, seriously, I don't think God's that interested in that. I mean, he's got an entire universe to run. Like, he's not worried about a conversation that took place years ago. Like, I'm not that important, thank you very much. I said, no, no, hold on. Actually, you are that important. Like, you are a child of God, and that means you have infinite worth. And if we live quorum Deo, it means that we are always, everything that happens, happens in the face of God. And God sees everything that happens, and God hears everything that happens, and God knows everything that happens, and God cares about everything that happens. So why don't we just imagine that conversation all over again? Why don't we just like, like be prayerful together? And just like you, you can obviously still hear it in your head, what your dad said to you all those years ago. So why don't we imagine like, like you hearing him say that again, but I want you to listen for another voice. I want you to listen to what was God saying to you at that time? And, and he was obviously a little doubtful, but he, he agreed. And so we just prayed and we sat in silence for a reasonable period of time. And in his head, he just imagined what had been probably the most painful experience in his life. And then something remarkable happened. And I mean, I couldn't know exactly what it was, but I could just see it. And he was just sobbing very deeply, but sobbing not in a way that is destructive, but in a way that is speaking about healing and coming back together again. And after a while, he, he came out of that and he looked at me and he said, you know, when I was there, I just, 
I felt like I heard God's voice coming to me. And I heard the words of Psalm 139. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I felt as I heard that voice that, that God was just saying to me, so, so take a choice here. You can hear your father saying, it's not as though that's going to put food in the table. And it's not as though that's studying medicine. Not sure that's worth terribly much. Or you can hear me saying, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I think that's the voice I'm supposed to listen to. I think that's the voice I'm supposed to listen to. That's, that's of course, is what Isaiah is saying. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering and reminded us that there is another truth about ourself. And, and here's the thing, like he had given up so much because of that first voice, his father's voice, his dad's voice that had said to him, like, like it's not medicine, thank you. Like he had listened to that voice and he had dropped out of running because of that. And he had limited himself, and he had limited who he could be, and he, he had kind of taken in all this story that, like, I'm not much of a person, thank you very much, because I don't meet the standard that is presumably the only standard that really actually matters. Like, like he had just held himself back. And when he was reminded of Psalm 139, reminded not just because it was there in Scripture, but because somehow it was the voice of God coming to him and saying to him, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are astonishing and you are my child. Like when you heard God saying that, he like said, so why am I still holding myself back? Why am I limiting myself? And he decided that he had joined the running team. Now, now listen, I don't want to be super unrealistic here. He joined the running team, but... Part of the sadness is actually, I mean, he got into the running team, but he didn't get into the state team, and he didn't break any national records. But he was running again, and he had great fun, and he enjoyed himself, and he, like, life came together again. And he started entering into thing, things, and he finished his engineering degree, and about a year or two afterwards, I bumped into him, and I said to him, so, so how's it going? I said, oh, really, 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 really enjoying my life, doing, doing well. And I said, and so how's it going with your dad? And he said, well, let's not be unrealistic here. Like, we still don't really get on, and I'm still not a doctor. I'm just an engineer, thank you very much. Uh, a running engineer now. But I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and that's more than enough for me. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and that is more than enough for me. Like, like that's what God does for us. I mean, the cross sees sins being forgiven, and that's amazing. But the cross also sees all that pain that happens in life somehow lifting and being taken from us, and we can see it in a new light. If you into Stoicism, uh, you might know that there's a, a wonderful little Stoic expression, amor fati, and amor fati, amor, love, fati, fate, love your fate, love your fate. And the Stoics teach that in life you need to kind of differentiate between what you can control and what you can't control. And the Stoics quite rightly say that there's so many things in life that we can't control. And they, they basically say, so why waste your time worrying about things that you really have no control over? There's nothing you can do about them. So sweating them is just, well, it is just a waste of time. So, so the things that you've got to embrace, just embrace them. And there is always something in your control. Say the Stoics, the thing that is in your control is not what happens to you, but your response to what happens to you. Like, like that's a very important Stoic principle. It is not what happens to you that you're in control of, but how you respond to it, you absolutely are in control of. And so embrace that, love your fate. Now, now you may say, well, that's Stoicism. I thought this was a Christian church. Thank you very much. Like, like what am I learning Stoicism for, for uh, this morning? Like, it's a good principle, but sometimes it can feel like whistling in the dark, can't it? Like, I'm not in control of things that happen, but, like, I will make the most of it, and I will embrace it, and I will rise up despite of this, and, like, it's good, but it can be whistling in the dark. And sometimes some things are so overwhelming that you just think, oh, I just wish there was more than that. And, and I think that there is actually a Christian stoic response, which you find in Romans chapter 8, 28 and 29. It is the conviction 
as Paul writes of it, that somehow all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to God's purposes. Now, now Paul is not wanting to be trite there. He is not saying, you know, everything is just wonderful and don't, you know, don't bother about everything, just smile, smile, smile. It's a, it's a great happy life. But Paul is saying, don't forget that when we say fate, we are actually saying God. And we are remembering that God is in control of everything. Now, there are some things that happen in life where Revelation 21 basically says to us, one day he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Doesn't say that's going to happen today. Like there's some things that happen in life that you just got to hold on to and say, Revelation 21, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. It's not necessarily going to happen today. It's not necessarily going to happen tomorrow, but it will ultimately happen because God is ultimately in control. And there are some things that are so devastating that we, we probably will not get over them in this lifetime. We wait for then when he will wipe every tear from our eyes. But because God is in control, ever so often, what we think has happened to us, we discover has actually happened for us. I think, for example, of my parents' divorce. When, when, when I was 13, my dad just announced, I'm leaving. It came as a huge shock. And my faith was starting to grow at that stage. And like if prayer was the determiner if something would happen, my father would have been found himself like just caught in this prayer magnet that would kind of just draw him back home because I prayed so earnestly that my father would actually return because I did not want him to leave, did not want him to leave at all. And I prayed as earnestly as a 13-year-old could. But you know what? He never did come back. He never did. And for a while, I felt kind of like disappointed with God. Like, how can you pray so hard and what you're praying for doesn't actually happen? And I could see how devastated my mother was. And I thought, that's just not fair. It's just not right. It's just not good. But prayer didn't seem to be doing anything about it. And so I just left that in the category of, well, not every prayer gets answered the way that you want. But like I kind of noticed that I was becoming part of the church's youth group at that time. And the church youth group for me became the home that didn't really have in any other way. And I started to take my faith really seriously. And, and here's the thing. My father had been having an affair and the woman he, he linked up with had actually been a Christian. Like, I mean, okay, not a very closely following Jesus Christian in the time of the affair, that's to state the obvious, but like she'd had a Christian background, she'd followed Jesus at one point. And like, as they continued on, she discovered God again and she came back to faith. And as she came back to faith, she said to my dad, you know, we really should go on a trip to Israel together. Like, I really want to do that. Now, my father had always been an atheist. Like, that's, that's my memory of my father when I was growing up, just a, a fairly strident atheist. So Israel was not, like, on the top of his bucket list at all. But, hey, like, here was this woman, and she wanted to do that, so, so he agreed, and he went to Israel. And in Israel, he just had a profound encounter with God, and he came to very deep faith. And he became an elder in, his, in, in the church he started attending, and they used to run a house church, and like everything changed for him. And for my mother, like it began a journey of searching for God that had not begun until that, until that point, and it finished with her finding God in an Alpha course. Like things, fate happens to you or for you. In a strange way, I think that actually that divorce happened for us, and, and don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that everything was wonderful about that or great. But in all things, God works together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. And sometimes we can see that now, and sometimes we wait for Revelation 21. He will ultimately wipe every tear from their eyes. And, and I wonder for you, what's your story? I mean, we've all got a story, haven't we? We've got those things that have gone amazingly well. And we've got those things that are just like they wear in us and we wonder why sometimes we find ourselves screaming and performing and like, that's just not me, but why am I doing that? And it's something that's there. And we need perhaps to hear again the words of Isaiah. Surely, surely, assuredly, he took up your pain. He took up your suffering. He did that at the cross 
And at the cross, he looks down on you and he says, sin forgiven. And you know what? You are fearfully and wondrously made. And yet I know that some things seem impossibly difficult and impossibly hard. But why not trust me? Why not trust me to be working fate, not just dumping it upon you. This is not happening to you. This is happening for you and for all the things that I want to bring from you and the growth I want to bring and the hope I want to birth. And even if you can't see that now, remember we are resurrection people who trust in the resurrection of Jesus and one day, one day, one day, every tear will be wiped from your eyes and from every eye. Let's pray together. And why not hear the word of Jesus just coming to you and saying, Assuredly, assuredly, I see, I hear, I know, I take your pain, take your suffering. And I'm willing to birth something beautiful from it. You are fearfully and wondrously made. You are no accident. I know. I care. I love. Trust me. Amen.